I want to uh, want, uh, welcome you here to the weekly meeting of the ERA Committee. Well, we're, we're, we're courts, we are, and uh, we're all distant appropriately. Um, today's meeting will get an oral briefing from the LOCKS Agency um, on its role and remit, as well as a, an update on the, the Moran Bay incident. An oral briefing from the Department on community uh, on common frameworks, a number of SRs, five of which are EU exit, a statutory instrument and a written briefing on the outbreak of avian influenza. Um, at the end of the meeting, we will move into closed session to consider the forward work programme, including the approach to the common frameworks. Um, Say so we're ready in open session. So I want to advise members that Claire, Philip, John, Morris and Patsy will be joining by Starleaf. You are uh, very welcome. I want to advise uh, members that, as per the recent letter from the Speaker to all MLAs, every attempt by members should be made to attend committee meetings virtually so as to adhere to the recent COVID-19 advice from the Executive. Uh, I can advise members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast through Parliament buildings and online, and you can use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and muted. Um, I have no apologies. Um, the chairperson's business, uh, members will recall that we cleared a number of letters to issue to Minister Gove, uh, HMRC, Minister Houghton and to their support service. A members will okay be forward the copies of the letters to the EU officer, the TEO, Infrastructure and the Economy Committee for their information. Okay. Uh, I want to refer members to number, item number three in your agenda. Uh, I want to invite, uh, refer members to the uh, draft minutes uh, of the meeting on the 14th of January at pages 7 to 14, and the draft minutes from the meeting of the 19th of January in the table of papers. Are members OK if I sign these? Yeah. Um, matters arising. Uh, I want to advise members that there's a copy of the research officers' PowerPoint presentation on agricultural policy developments in uh, the UK, Ireland, and other selected jurisdictions at pages 16 to 21, which members received a presentation on at last week's meeting. As requested at the meeting last week, members will also find a briefing note from the Research and Information Services on the UK Shared Prosperity Fund in the tabled papers. Um, so item five on the agenda, we're going to have a, a, an oral briefing from the LOCKS Agency uh, role and remit and the update on the Moran Bay incident. I want to refer members to the memo uh, from the clerk. Um, at pages 23 to 30, and a written briefing from the LOCKS Agency at 31 to 45, alongside an update on the Moran Bay incident at pages 46 to 49. I want to welcome by Starleaf at this juncture uh, Mark uh, McCohan, uh, Chief Fisheries Officer at DERA, Mark Wright, uh, Head of uh, Conservation Designation and Protection DERA, John McCartney, Director of Conservation and Protection, LOCKS Agency. J.P. O'Doherty, Acting Corporate Services uh, Director of Lock Citizens. You're very welcome this morning. And I'd like to invite the officials uh, to uh, commence your briefing, and then members will obviously want to ask some questions thereafter. So thank you very much, and you're very welcome this morning. I can Mark. Um, but if you want to ask somebody else to maybe make a start. Mark Eyre. Is that Mark Eyre? All right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay we've got um, John, Mark. Uh, there's a Mark McCohan. Is Mark not online as yet? No. And we have jo JP, uh, John, right. JP, John McCartney there. Um, can, can, you, can you guys hear us okay? Yeah, can hear you. Yeah, well, well but, uh, do, do you want to maybe uh, commence uh, the, 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 your brief in there? Okay. Um, well, thanks very much, Chair. Good morning, all. Um, I'll like to acknowledge and thank you for your invitation um, and your opening remarks. Um, as you can see in the detailed report from ourselves, um, we've continued to deliver our statutory remit during the past 12 months. And indeed, uh, we're continuing to successfully deliver our core functions during the, co the current restrictions uh, in line with the government guidelines. Um, in relation to COVID-19, and John will go into a bit more detail about that, but our fishery protection staff and our scientific teams are continuing to deliver our f full range of duties. Um, we removed all our uh, administration functions with ease to working from home. Um, our offices remain closed to the public. And a planned return to offices has been put on hold, uh, but it will be kept under review in line with governing guidelines. Um, 
with the reopening of angling uh, and the drive and uh, by the domestic staycation market, uh, we are expecting an increase in demand for marine tourism and outdoor activities um, that comply with government guidelines. Um, we saw last year that angling in particular seen an increase in demand um, and it, it appeals to all generations. Private fisheries, angling clubs and um, tackle shops all, all reported a, an unprecedented demand. And the challenge now for us is to keep the public hooked on these activities and we we'll continue to work and support these sectors to help and develop promote a uh, sustainable approach to providing great outdoor experiences. Um, a wee bit about our EU funding. Um, we've been successful in securing EU funding as both lead partner and project partner with a number of projects over the years. Uh, we're currently involved in three projects, Sea Monitor, Catchment Care and Swell. All of these projects, um, past and present, have enhanced the delivery of our fisheries management remit and developed a wealth of institutional memory and lear learning. Uh, we've provided us with the ability to forward thinking and not only apply best practice in our remit, but also influence international best practice. Um, we partner obviously with a lot of um, agencies and departments and universities within these. Um, some of them being Queen's, the Marine Institute, Galway, Mayo Institute, the AFPE, University of Glasgow and the University of Col College Cork. We're continuing to work in partnership with a number of other agencies as well and delivering a range of projects including climate change initiatives. Uh, we successfully del uh, delivered riparian projects um, th through partnership with NI Water and Woodland Trust. Um, one of our projects in the Fahan Valley has uh, since 2015 has seen us plant over 86,000 native trees. Um, our partnership with the Woodland Trust, we've created a model which will be used to upscale delivery of wet woods projects across the Foyle and Carlingford catchments. Uh, we're currently working with them um, now on a three-year program to develop such projects uh, and implement them. Um, we've also in the last year developed a new 10-year strategic direction, uh, which, we, which will guide us uh, and the work of our, the agency moving forward and to start discharging our core functions. Um, we haven't deviated from our statutory functions as set out in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, um, but it does ensure that we are embedded, we are that what we're doing in all our projects uh, is planned for the future, uh, and that our staff and our stakeholders clearly understand what the what, what our core business is. Our mission is uh, is to sustainably manage, promote, and develop the fisheries and resources of the Foyle and Cardwell areas. Our vision is to enable delivery of our remit through partnership and science protecting and developing our fisheries and natural resources. Um, so I hope I've provided you with a sort of sense and scope of what we're doing and our focus at the minute and our commitment to ensuring we carry out our remit to optimal effect, uh, working with the assistance and support, support of both administrations, um, North and South. Uh, we want to ensure you that um, as an institution that was created way back in 1952, that. Um, we're prepared to work with our partners and our departments on some of the very real challenges ahead relating to fisheries and environmental conservation and pro protection and enforcement and to explore and reinvigorate and shared approach to tackling some of the biggest environmental challenges our, our generation will face. Uh, I'll pass over here now to John to give you a bit of an update on our um, conservation protection. Some technical issue here, John. We can't we can't hear you, John, at all. No. Can't hear you. Maybe not just on to the gear update on Morn Bay. Yeah. I wonder I wonder, John, I wonder could we get move on and we'll come back to you if we can get this resolved, John, if we could just get the deer update on the Morn Bay incident. You're frozen completely, John. Can we can we get the deer update on the Morn Bay incident? Um, Mark, 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 can you hear us, Mark? Right? 
Mark, would you be in a position to give us an update on the Morn Bay incident? Because we're, we're not getting John here at the minute. He seemed to have frozen. He's disappeared, disappeared altogether. I may come back on again, sorry, mate. Um, well, well th 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 thanks very much. Um, um, yeah, so, th so the, the, the Morn, um, the, the, the Morn Bag, the, the Meal um, Bog slip ha has been quite a catastrophe um, and has you know, created a, an unprecedented um, position that we're in. Um, re re really, um, the Locks Agency, I, I, I'm within the department, of course, but the Locks Agency are the lead um, in, in, in responding to that. Um, and and uh, when John comes back, I'm sure he'll um, give us a bit a bit more of the detail. Um, and initially, initially, the the focus was on pre preventing any further um, potential damage. I see, I see John's back in, so I don't know whether, uh, Chair, you want to yeah. try and get John back on again. Yeah, John, can you can you hear us now? Uh, I can hear you, Mr. Sherman. Can oh, you hear me now? Good morning, John. We got you. Yeah, you're you're in full steam now, okay. sir. Yeah. I, I had some difficulty with my computer, so I, I've had to go on to the phone here. But, yeah. um, uh, Mr. Sherman, look, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to address the committee, and uh, I'm very encouraged by the interest that the committee has shown in in this particular incident. Um, in relation to the Mornbeg River. I have supplied a briefing paper, but I'll very, um, very quickly summarise, um, if that's okay, on, on where we are at the moment. As you're aware, on, on mid-November, um, there was a significant uh, peat bog slip at the top end of the Mornbeg River. Um, this slip is currently um, under criminal investigation, so the, the committee will understand that, that um, I'm unable to name particular um, parties under investigation, but I can say that we are in the latter stages of initial data collection. The peat slip has had a significant effect um, on the Mornbeg River, um, which is obviously a highly prized river. It's um, uh, designated under um, ASSI designation and feeds into the River Dur as an SAC and as an SAC in itself. The investigation has been complicated um, because the incident itself occurred in the Republic um, and obviously the principal effects were then in Northern Ireland and those effects obviously included the direct effects on the Mornbeg fishery which has both um, Atlantic salmon, sea trout, indigenous brown trout, lamprey eel, and other prize species within it. Um, to attempt to manage this um, unusual um, and catastrophic incident, uh, LOX Agency have been working closely with a number of partners. Um, we have set up two working groups, um, which are meeting at the moment on a, a weekly or fortnightly basis. One is working almost entirely on looking at the restoration options, and the other is an enforcement working group looking at the different overlaps of, for enforcement between different agencies. The agencies that are involved in this um, are on the Northern Ireland side, Northern Ireland Environment Agency, um, split between the Environmental Liability Directive, um, my colleague Mark Wright's um, staff in conservation designations, significant support from Northern Ireland Environment Agency's Water Management Unit. We also have on board Derry City and Strabane District Council, and we are uh, have included Northern Ireland Water in our working groups because the initial incident forced them to shut down the drinking water abstraction at Tiverny Wastewater, uh, Tiverny Water Treatment Works, which is part of the supply for the area. On the Irish side, then we also have working with the Stonegall County Council, both planning enforcement, environment section, and their engineers. We have had um, significant support and assistance from the Irish Environmental Protection Agency, and obviously from National Parks and Wildlife Service as well. Um, at the moment, the site 
and I always say this with a degree of trepidation, but the site is stable at the moment. The developer has stopped all wind farm development works and is working principally on those works to contain and manage um, the water and, and, and any moving peat on the site. Um, the company have also engaged a variety of engineers, consultants, including ecologists, um, to feed in information into um, the, the longer term way forward. We are still obviously trying to collate background data um, and, uh, and impact data on the river. And because we're working with Atlantic salmon at the moment who have um, created reds on the river, we, we can't be too invasive on in what we do, but we are continuing to monitor the situation on a very regular basis with our partners. Um, the next stage for us is to look in detail at restoration plans, to look at what we need to do to bring the Mornbeg River back to its um, previous position and full potential. Um, that's a brief summary, Mr. Chairman, of where we are, and I'm happy to take any questions anybody and anybody would have in relation to any of those aspects. Um. Thank you, thank you for that, John. Um, and in, in your report, you you referred to uh, the after the the landslip happened that the river was transformed into uh, a black porridge. And I can say that whenever I actually visited the site myself, along with a local MLA in that area, Alicia McEwan, Kieran McGuire, local councillor, and I can say that, uh, that that that's a very accurate description. So it is. Um, and I know uh, you're you're currently data gathering and doing your assessment. Do you, do you have any assessment at this point as yet as to the, the long-term damage that there will be to both the, the bed of the river there and indeed to the, the fish stocks in the, in the area, um, John? Mr. Chairman, the, 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 um, in relation to the fish stocks, our initial indication is that there is a significant effect on the fishery um, for a number of miles from the site. Um, the ability of um, salmonid fish to recolonize is um, often surprising, but it will be the spring before we can actually get in there to carry out further electrofishing surveys to determine um, how much recolonization has taken place. Um, and that will actually be one of the fundamental cornerstones to development of, of a, um, a recovery a reinstatement um, plan once we have that information gathered. In relation to the bed of the river, I am concerned that the interspatial areas in the gravel, um, which are um, a, a key part of the fisheries ecosystem, um, may be clogged with um, peat and fine sediment. And again, once we have done full evaluations of that aspect, the um, restoration program will try, hopefully, and address where we can those issues, um, if that helps, Mr Chairman. Yeah, uh, thank you, John. And uh, just one last point before I just move around the room. In your uh, written report, you indicated that uh, NA Water hadn't at yet provided lock stations with any indication as to if there any um, impact on the uh, quality of the drinking water. Now, I understand that that that, that, that hasn't, in, in, in the Donegal side, that it, they haven't identified any impact on the drinking water, but uh, i just wondering, have you had any update from any water? Um, because I understand they uh, abstract uh, in the region of uh, our straw. Um, have you... Have you as yet any indication from any water as to if there has been any impact on the uh, the quality of the drinking water? Uh, Mr Chairman, while, while not being an expert on, on drinking water, I, I am aware that Northern Ireland Water um, had to shut down their abstraction um, from the River Derg at Ardstraw um, for a period of time. And they augmented that with a um, abstra abstraction point on the River Morn at Newton Stewart. Um, to make up the um, to make up the shortfall in, in, in public supply, um, they have that um, ability to do that um, to ensure that the public supply is maintained. Uh, I am aware that they have had um, a number of issues um, related to both 
the um, incident we're discussing today and other incidents that have caused them to um, augment the supply from the River Morn. But I don't believe um, that there is any threat to, to the public supply uh, or public health, but that really is a matter for, for Northern Ireland Water to, to um, report to the committee. Uh, um, Mr Chairman. Thank you, John. Rosemary. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your report. Um, just mine's a broader based question. It's just ask, do you have any plans perhaps to revisit some of the wind farms that are being established here in Northern Ireland? In relation to perhaps what has happened in the Republic? Um, we would respond to pollution incidents uh, in the same way our colleagues in Northern Ireland Environment Agency do as they come in. Proactively, we feel that the wind farms that are constructed probably pose uh, a lesser threat than those under construction. However, where wind farms and other major developments are uh, taking place within the catchment, we will and continue to proactively look at those um, to uh, advise on the ecological sensitivity of the receiving waterways and deal with incidents as they occur, if that helps. Okay, yeah, that's okay. Okay, um, William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. I gather, I was going to ask what steps have been taken to rectify the damage, but I, I, what I gather from you, other than monitor the situation at the moment, there's very little you can do. Is that right to the springtime? Is that, is that what I gather? Yes? Yes, sir. The, 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 the difficulty is that in any major incident, the first priority has to be to contain, stop and limit the damage from the incident. And I know that we're into January now, but um, given the nature and size of this incident, we're only just coming out of what we can consider to be a containment phase where we have been working very hard with colleagues, particularly from Donegal County Council, who have been uh, um, a great support uh, in ensuring that steps are taken on the site to minimize the environmental impact and that those steps, um, which uh, if, if I could explain, you know, the, one of the steps is building a series of holding dams. And of course, when we have as much rain as we had yesterday, for example, um, building a holding dam then takes a substantial amount of maintenance to keep it as a holding dam and, and trying our best to ensure that um, there is no further environmental impact from the site. Um, in terms of the longer term restoration of the site, once we get uh, our baseline information, once we once we are absolutely sure of how we're going to spend whatever funds that we can find to, to deal with the issue, um, then we'll move into that 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 secondary phase. Can I ask this? In relation to the, the rectifying of the damage and uh, in in the future, uh, who is liable for the cost of that? Um, that, that's, that's a very interesting question that there, there, there are possibilities of, um, civil compensation being sought if a successful criminal uh, action can be, um, achieved. But I understand colleagues in the Environmental Protection Agency in Ireland, um, supported by colleagues in Northern Ireland Environment Agency in Northern Ireland are also looking at a route, um, based on the Environmental Liability Directive and the associated regulations in both jurisdictions. Okay, um, William. Um, Philip? Philip? Chair, uh, I, I had a point or a question on this issue, but it's actually been addressed. Uh, so I have a number of other general points, but I'm happy enough to uh, come back whenever this issue has been addressed and all the presentations have been given. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, um, Claire? Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you for your presentation. Can I ask, I, I just know that, uh, do, do, uh, does everybody in the LOX agency work for the department? Or the, is it civil service staff? Or did the LOX agency have independent staff as well? The, 
The um, Blocks Agency is a, an arm's length body, yeah. and we're jointly funded by um, Northern Ireland government and the government of Ireland uh, on a 50-50 basis. So um, while we are public officials, we're not strictly civil servants, if that answers the question. Okay. So just uh, with the, the main bog then, um, I know that you've said that there are um, investigations going on and you can't identify who is under investigation. So I maybe want to ask you then, would you agree that this complete disaster was essentially the result of a failure in planning? Or has other work, you know, was there planning permission granted for that wind farm and was the work then undertaken or actions that led to the disaster or did they just do work? Was the farm just compliant with their planning permission? Um, to answer the question, uh, and the initial planning application, I understand, was refused by Donegal County Council as the planning authority. Um, my understanding is it was then taken to Inboard Planalo, which is the equivalent of the Planning Appeals Commission uh, in Northern Ireland, and was granted planning permission um, uh, by the board. Uh, in terms of whether or not this incident was caused by irregularities in the application of that planning um, permission is a matter that is under investigation by colleagues in Donegal County Council's planning enforcement branch. Um, and I wouldn't be in a position um, to preempt their findings at this stage. Okay, uh, I suppose then, is it a concern to yourselves in the Locks Agency that you're not recognised as a statutory consultee as defined in the planning order of Northern Ireland? Um, there is some confusion uh, in relation to this aspect um, under the Planning General Development Procedure Order in Northern Ireland 19, 2015 okay. Okay. Um, the, and subsequently Section 14 of the Planning General Development Procedure Order. Um, the LOCKS Agency is not specified in the schedules, but the Department of Agriculture, Environmental and Rural Affairs is. Um, as LOCKS Agency under the 1966 Fisheries Act have uh, are the competent authority for fisheries in the Foyle and Carlingford area, planning service in Northern Ireland has deemed that um, we are dealt with as a statutory consultee. In fact, on our work um, planning, on our planning consultation work use, um, we're listed as a statutory consultee. Um, LOCKS Agency would obviously prefer to see um, an amendment to the legislation, and particularly in Schedule 3, um, that, that uh, we're listed as a specific um, uh, uh, consultee, um, but we are dealt with and treated as a statutory consultee by all of the district councils currently undertaking planning functions. I know that the lack of a specific um, Listing for LOCKS Agency has um, been highlighted in some uh, other places, uh, and I know that that has become an issue. Um, however, in Ireland, under the Planning and Development Regulations 2001, the LOCKS Agency is deemed as one of the fisheries boards, um, which um, make us a statutory consultee for Donegal and Louth um, by, virtue of the, um, by virtue of that. But do, do you think that there's a risk this incident could be repeated in the, the foil and calling for catchments? Uh, sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. You're okay. Thank you for your comprehensive answer there. That was good to hear. Thanks. But do you feel that there's um, risk that this incident could be repeated in the foil and calling food catchment areas? I think that the... The risk of a further um, landslide or peat slide is um, ever present. Um, the difficulties um, relate to both the extremes of climate that we're seeing and, and the um, effects of climate change, plus the desire to develop areas, um, particularly hill areas and upland areas that have never really been considered for development before. Um, and these pose ob obvious risks that really 
must be taken into account during a planning process um, and during a planning application process. The difficulty for myself and many of the other colleagues who look after environmental issues, um, ours being principally fisheries, is that um, detailed engineering assessments um, are often provided by developers. Um, and while we can highlight the environmental receptor and the potential damage to the environmental receptor and make some standard recommendations, analysis and interpretation of those detailed engineering um, assessments is beyond the scope of the agency and has to be undertaken then by more competent people um, with an engineering expertise from within planning service. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, Philip, you look, you looking in there again? <clears throat> Chair, thank you. I, I mean, I, I just wanted to ask you just in relation to the impact of Brexit in the work. Uh, so, I mean, if I could maybe just ask how has work uh, been affected by Brexit and, you know, will, will there be a continuation of uh, EU funding? Uh, and then just maybe the, any impact on fishermen from north-south in terms of access to the locks post-Brexit? Um, yeah, I think that the, the answer um, is really tied up in the history of, of the organisation. The Foil Fisheries Commission was established in 1952 prior to Brexit, and the regulations, particularly the primary regulation that um, supports the functions of the, the um, Foy Fisheries Commission were transferred to the LOCKS Agency uh, under the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Um, we, at this time, um, have had no direct effects of Brexit um, and we have had no difficulty in carrying out our cross-border enforcement function. Um, we have a working partnership with other enforcement agencies, including, including in Garda Shikona and PSNI, um, in relation to uh, uh, border movements and staff movements. And uh, at this time, um, uh, we, we don't appear to be affected by the Brexit issue. In terms of uh, continued funding, it's not my area of expertise, but my understanding is that, that um, funding for research projects and for um, the uh, EU projects that we're currently uh, involved in is stable and, and to be maintained. So I, I don't see um, a specific issue there, but obviously regulations and, 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 um, <clears throat> and politics change and we, we, we'll have to see it um, on down the line. Um, was there a third part to your question? Sorry. It was just about uh, any potential impact of fishermen north and south uh, having access to the lock. I mean, and, and just even following on from that, I mean, obviously we have raised at committee and it's been raised numerous occasions about the ownership issues of the lock. So, I mean, just want to kind of take this opportunity maybe to ask yourselves, I mean, does the locks agency have any, any, uh, view on the ownership of the lock or how to resolve it or any suggestions for resolving that issue? Um, yeah, well, first of all, in relation to access to the lock, uh, my understanding is that that is uh, any issues that have arisen so far have been in relation to pelagic fisheries and perhaps Mark McCohan from Deere would be better to answer that. Um, I understand that the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority in Ireland have also had a number of issues in relation to accessing ports, but I think the minister may have signed a um, a, a, a piece of legislation yesterday, um, which um, which will come into force on the first of February, which which uh, may um, uh, may ease that. Now I can't be sure on that because it's a pelagic fisheries issue, and as such, outside of the direct area of the, of the locks agency, the locks agency in relation to. Um, the ownership of the bed and the, the, the um, and, and, and of lock foil. Um, obviously, you may well be aware we have um, aquaculture licensing regulations that are currently not commenced. Um, and this has led to unregulated oyster farming and lock foil, which is an inextricably linked to the jurisdictional issue. 
but can only be resolved by the agreement of two governments, um, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in London, the Department of Foreign Affairs in, in Ireland. The jurisdiction has just created practical difficulties in creating a system for licensing of aquaculture and log foil, and consequently there's a significant unregulated activity. Um, currently, the LOX agency has no statutory remit, remit or authority to intervene. That unregulated activity is creating a number of hazards and risks, including the potential threat to the introduction of non-native species and a general environmental threat. <clears throat> the agency is aware that the minister wrote to Northern Ireland Secretary of State to raise concerns about the unre unregulated activity <clears throat> and to seek an update on progress made by go both governments. And the agency has been advised that the Minister of State for Northern Ireland responded, advising that the UK government recognises the need to take action and it remains committed <clears throat> to the agency having responsibility for the regulation of aquaculture and lock foil. Um, we understand that the letter has advised that the UK government is committed to working closely with the Irish government over improvements to management of the locks. The agency is therefore hopeful that progress can be made by both governments to develop a, a management agreement for lock foil, which would, enab would enable the agency to regulate aquaculture um, within the lock as such. Does that, does that answer the question? <laughs> well, I mean, I understand it is, it is a political. I think that's a similar answer that we got uh, when the question was asked uh, perhaps six or eight months ago or maybe longer. So I understand it is a political. I mean, it's an issue that does need resolved. Uh, and I mean, I suppose we, from the committee's point of view, we should ensure that pressure is maintained uh, to should, uh, get it resolved. One final point uh, on an, another issue. I mean, I, I, I was interested to hear uh, JP when he was talking about the just transition and the climate change uh, work of, of the LOX agency. So, if there was any other details uh, that you could provide on that work, I think it would be useful as well. Uh, yes, I shall happily uh, make a note of that and, and perhaps um, have uh, something passed to yourself in the, in, the, in, in the near future. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, John. We'll talk about fish kill, John. So how many fish would you say we've lost because of this slippage? And as well as that, moving your own to make it easier. Do you think that this slippage occurred solely because of construction works, or do you think it could have been a natural disaster that could possibly have happened anyway? Thank you. Um, I, uh, I don't wish to appear evasive, but the definition and direct number of, of dead fish um, is part of the uh, criminal case assessment. Um, although this was significantly affected by very, very high rainfalls, um, both during and after the event, and the difficulty in recovering fish um, because of the color um, and nature that the water um, once polluted became. In terms of whether or not this was a natural occurrence or whether it was caused by construction, that is probably the cornerstone of, of the investigations being undertaken um, by colleagues in the Environmental Protection Agency, and I wouldn't want to preempt their findings uh, at this time. Yep. Uh, apologies if that uh, uh, seems evasive. How it is? That's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, just before we move on, uh, John Blair, I, I think it's important that we should point out that they um, very much welcome the fact that Minister Putz and his counterpart, Minister McConnell, -Logue, met uh, on site to assess the damage to themselves. Um, and I suppose just when we have the public forum here, also the Senator best wishes to Minister Pooch as well. We, we noted from recent um, reports that he has been a cancer diagnosis, so we send our, our best wishes as well. Um, so, John, John Blair. Chairman, thank you. Can I thank John and the others for <coughs> being with us today and, and presenting? Um, and a very, very brief to, to the more big incident, I'm grateful for that um, update. Um, there, there's been a very keen interest expressed at this committee and, and all of our inboxes will have been contacted um, outside this committee. And uh, I'm very keen that when we move beyond what was described as a containment stage, we, we might be able to be updated further on, on progress, on, on restoration and obviously pursuit of any uh, legal inquiries that are going on, notwithstanding the, the 
sensitivities around those at, at this stage. The questions are, are broader than, than, than that issue because I think we've covered it very well. And the first one is, uh, I noticed in the report to us from the, the LOCKS agency in a section described as key work programmes, there's reference to marine tourism, but not necessarily specifically uh, angling development. And that's something that's been raised with us by the Ulster Angling Federation and others, as committee members will know. Now, angling development is mentioned elsewhere in the report, so, so I'm keen to know, um, <clears throat> outside of this year's difficulties with COVID and, and public engagement being, being hindered in that regard, what overall plans are there to develop um, angling in uh, this jurisdiction as a, first of all, recreational activity to be conducted outdoors? Uh, and secondly, um, in relation to, to tourism. And following on from the <coughs> excuse me, tourism issue, um, second question on licensing. <coughs> uh, committee members here will know, <coughs> and I've referred to it a number of times, I, I formerly worked for Renland Fisheries, that, that's well known, and I'm well familiar then with having to describe to um, German tourists and French tourists that, that, uh, and others that an island this size has three separate licensing regimes and it's a very confusing situation. Has any work been done to try to uh, better coordinate, bring together that system so that three different licensing uh, uh, license systems are not operating on this island and creating a barrier to those who want to purchase the license move between north and south and fish, fish across the borders at work? Um, if I could say that those issues are outside of my um, director and perhaps Mr. O'Doherty, my colleague, would, would, would have uh, a view on those, uh, if, if that's... Uh... Um, yeah, well, in terms of uh, angling development, um, we, we recently appointed a, an angling development manager, a uh, temporary one, uh, from within our own uh, core budget and our core staff. Um, so the way we're looking at that is a ho very holistic approach. Um, we're, we don't just see it as a, attended events and things like that. We're seeing it more as a partnership and a collaborative working in, in terms of working with our scientists and working with our inspectors and working with like-minded organizations in Ireland. Um, we can get you full details of what, what the proposals are and the plans are in relation to that, but we, ha we, we haven't um, ignored England development. Uh, we see it very much as a, a very much a statutory function and it's something that we're going we're gonna to look into and we are keen to develop it. Hence, why we've appointed the England Development Manager now for a two-year period. Um, so there, there will be a review of angling done, and that will include uh, consultation with all the local angling clubs and any stakeholders that are involved in that. So we, we're, we're keen to progress that, and it is something we take very seriously. Um, in relation to the, um, the licensing, um, we are aware that um, with three licenses, it does create difficulties, and we are we are open to uh, engaging with conversations with the rest of the like-minded organisations and seeing if there's a way around that. Um, I don't believe there's a quick fix, but we can certainly engage in conversations with them um, and begin those discussions. Okay, good. grateful for that. Then just to clarify, there, there's not currently, and there probably hasn't been there for in recent times, any further examination of reviewing the licensing system as it stands. Well, we're, we're continuing. This is a responsibility of DERA and the, the Irish government and others as well. It's not simply a, a logs agency issue, and I'm well aware of that. Yeah, so that, and that's why I'm saying we're keen to we're, we're keen to engage in those conversations. Um, and there are conversations that probably need to be had. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we will commit to, that, to doing that, to, to certainly getting involved in them. Um, it's, it's probably not a simple fix, but it's something that we can certainly look at. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Mar Morris? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, back to the to the Moran Bay, uh, unfortunately, and a few few concerns I have. Uh, I read the report and it says that you have access concerning the Moran Moran Bay into uh, damage caused to the River Derg. Could you tell me what that data tells uh, us about the damage to the native trout populations and the migration of the Atlantic salmon into the Derg? Also, what's your initial thoughts on any damage to the spawning beds in the River Derg itself? And has there been any damage caused further downstream? Uh, when I say that, has there been any damage to the River Foyle, which is the main river for the migrating salmon to its tributaries, including the River Derg and into the Moan Beg? 
Um, yeah, um, in relation to the River Derg, the, <clears throat> the Derg is um, one of our best um, salmon fisheries and uh, uh, an area that we, uh, we take very, very, very seriously as we do all rivers. <clears throat> we did note um, during our evaluations um, that fish had begun to red on the River Derg and that even um, below the confluence of the Mornbeg River, um, fish were actively cutting reds and, um, and, and carrying out their normal life cycle um, activities. Um, the issue for us um, is in relation to whether the survival rate from those reds um, is, um, remains uh, at its optimal. Um, we won't be able to determine that until um, the reds begin to hatch and it'll be the spring before we can actually definitively say um, whether there was a specific effect on the uh, ability of fish to um, breed in the river Derg. In relation to the wider foil catchment, um, at this time, we don't believe that um, other than the irritation by sedimentation um, that would be caused by an event of this nature, um, that there are any other specific effects. But again, we can only determine that when we carry out our spring electrofishing um, to look um, and determine if there has been a change in population structure downstream from the Mornbeg through the Derg to its confluence with the Struel and subsequently into the Morn. Um, so I suppose the answer to the question is, is, is uh, we don't have the data yet to properly answer that question and won't have until the springtime. Okay, thanks very much, John, for that there. Just one other wee thing, and it's a, it's a, uh, it's a wild card, I suppose. But <laughs> peat, peat breaks down and it's very, very fine particles and, and moving water, and as such can move quite a distance. Do you find any uh, sediment has made its way actually into Loch Foyle itself? I know it's a brief distance, but uh, in the, cli the climate we have at the moment and, and the state of the rivers, the water is very fast flowing. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that all sediment um, ends up at some point or other in, into the estuarine area, into the mud banks and into the estuaries of Loch Foyle. Uh, whether it will change the ecosystem, um, even with that quantity of material, is, is probably unlikely. Um, taking yesterday, I was on both the Fawn and on the, the Derg, um, and the water height um, at the new, as, as the flood was receding was carrying enormous amounts of, of material, both soil um, and, and just natural sediment, and it is part of the natural process. Um, I, I suppose on a wider point, it really feeds into the issue of the extremes of climate and climate change in that um, nature uh, will um, distribute materials within a river system as part of its natural, uh, uh, natural process. Um, but it's whether that distribution of materials within the river to its estuaries then out into the loch um, is being widely affected by the extremes of climate change is probably a bigger question that we, we need to sit back and look at at some point in the future. Yeah, John, I, I would agree with that uh, sentiment. And uh, listen, thank you very much for your detailed answers. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. Rosemary, you're looking back in there? Yeah, just, just one last question. And that's to do with, um, we, you spoke about salmon earlier. It's in relation to salmon poaching on Loch Foyle. Do you find that as much of a problem at the moment? Um, if we go back historically to um, to um, the 1950s, the, the reason that the Foyle Fisheries Commission was set up was to tackle salmon poaching um, and illegal salmon fishing. And the LOX agency um, has taken on the, the role um, within um, both the loch and and uh, and in, within the rivers. Salmon poaching is 
um, always there. Um, it's continuous, and um, every year we will seize um, illegal nets, boats, illegally caught fish, and we will prosecute people for illegal poaching, as we have done last year and every year, since, I think, since 1952. Uh, unfortunately, um, salmon poaching is... is uh, is just a fact of life that we have to deal with. Um, and we do do our best to deal with it as, as effectively as possible. So, in other words, you're not seeing any reduction in salmon poaching? Um, I wouldn't say that we're seeing a reduction. The, 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 you know, the difficulty with quantifying salmon poaching is it, is it has to be quantified against the size, nature, and, and, and quality of a run of fish. Um, so while we may have had um, less poaching in years when there was less fish, um, we tend to get more poaching in years when we have a good run of fish. Um, so the, you know, the numbers, um, the, the bare statistics as numbers um, often don't reflect the, 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 full, the full picture as such. So, so you would say you have enough powers to help control or try and stop this poaching. You have enough power at the moment to do that. Um, the regulations have worked exceptionally well um, since 1952. Obviously, like any um, suite of, of um, uh, any suite of regulations that are um, are used. Um, Different court cases throw up different um, aspects that may um, drive us towards seeking amendments. Uh, but the current provision um, for fisheries protection is um, uh, is is working at the moment. Um, up to today, always um, <laughs> uh, I have to caveat that with that. And to, just to, uh, while I was talking here, I've managed to find um, a, 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 um, some indication. Last year, we seized um, 30 illegal nets um, and seven boats, uh, seven boats um, uh, form and, and 70 fish. I'm not sure all of those were Atlantic salmon, but uh, it gives you an idea that the, the um, salmon poaching continues and, and, and uh, and uh, doesn't seem to go away. Thank you. Okay, um, Claire, were you looking back in again, or or is that hand up from a previous time? No, I was looking back in. If yeah. possible, please. No Claire. problem, Claire. Absolutely. Thank you, um, and, and thanks very much for letting me in. I want to stick with the rivers there. We, we know that the the River Fawn, Row, Finn, uh, Morn, um, are all under your your thing, but we know that the. the that they have not met management targets or conservation limits in 2019. And still, I think that, um, as far as I'm aware anyway, the River Finn still remains as a significant concern. Um, and the River Row and its tributaries to the Special Areas of Conservation is exceeding its critical load for nitrogen deposition. So I'm wondering if you could give us any more detail on why those targets are not being met and if that still continues to be the case. Um, yet yeah, in 2020, the River Row recovered back up and achieved its management targets and its conservation limits. Um, it's met its management, it's met its conservation limit in 2019, but didn't meet its conservation limit. Um, the River Finn, unfortunately, is a completely different story, and really, the River Finn hasn't done well for a number of years and hasn't met its conservation limits and hasn't met its management targets. And that is one of the reasons that some of the uh, European projects have been orientated towards water quality. Um, and uh, some of the uh, um, activity on the, on the ground on the River Finn is funded by the European projects in, in, in uh, an attempt to uh, improve those. We suspect that the principal Difficulty on the River Finn is sea survival of the um, of the outgoing smolts, which is an international um, issue rather than a local issue. However, Locks Agency 
um, feeds into the various international protocols. Um, we are um, working very hard to try and protect the river fin from both pollution and from poaching in the hope that we can reverse the, um, the, the currently the current concerning trend in terms of the population. Thanks. We know that last year anglers in particular um, raised concerns, expressed concerns, sorry, that the water quality, um, particularly in the River Row, um, or just at the state of the water quality, um, and they were concerned that there was this, it was due to the spreading of waste um, on land from farming and agriculture. Do you, would you agree, or, or, or any findings from your end um, that um, potentially ammonia pollution is affecting the water quality in our rivers, um, particularly the roe and the fin, um, and has that have any impact on salmon stocks? Um, Lox Agency's pollution response is normally for um, point source point point source pollution, where it actually enters the river. Um, the areas of diffuse pollution of control of ammonia emissions um, and, in, and control of ammonia levels really fall to our colleagues in Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Um, you know, if, if I could explain it in, in that um, diffuse pollution is um, on, such a, uh, on such a scale that it doesn't have an acute effect on fish it may have a long-term effect. It may have a a a, um, a, a more um, silent uh, effect, um, but we have to rely on our colleagues from Northern Ireland Environment Agency um, to uh, advise us and ensure us that the application of agricultural material um, to land is both suitable and done within the regulations which they have uh, in place to control it. And with evidence that you see from your um, area of work, um, say that everything possible is being done, or are you satisfied that um, that all work is being monitored? Are all um, the right issues? It, it, it's, it would be a question that would be better directed at North Ireland Environment Agency in relation to the complexity of both licensing and regulatory enforcement that, that, that they carry out in relation to the management of application of slurries and, and uh, other materials to, to land. Um, you know, we tend as an organization because of the nature of the work that we do to stay on the river bank, to stay in the river, to work on in the river on the fish. Um, issues like ammonia and, and diffuse pollution are not visible and never would be visible um, until they become such a serious problem that, that it's too late, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes absolute sense. Um, okay, thank you very much, John. Cheers. Yeah, Harry, go ahead. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Chair. John, I'm just wondering um, what you could tell me. You received EU funding for a sea monitor project back in 2018. That was a four-year project. I'm just wondering what benefits that has been to you and what you're using it for at present. Thank you. Um, again, it's slightly outside of my area of expertise, and I can have somebody send you um, uh, full details on the, the Sea Monitor project. Um, but the fundamental basic principle of the Sea Monitor project is for us to determine the migratory routes of Atlantic salmon at these different life stages um, and to look at where the pressure points affects and um, and, and uh, impacts on the march so that we can look uh, to see if they can be better managed. The Sea Monitor project is also um, is, a, is, a, is a, an enormous collaboration with a large number of partners and um, there's also included a monitoring of a wide range of other marine species, many of which that have interactions with um, uh, with the Atlantic salmon. Um, but we're more than happy to send you a full full project brief and, and, and a project update um, if, if you if you'd like to see one. 
appreciate that. Sounds interesting. Yes, thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Chair. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, well, thank you. I have no other members down to speak here, but I'll just... Uh, oh, sorry. Patsy has just put his hand up. Patsy. Patsy Malone. Can you hear me? Oh, well, thanks very much, Chair. I wasn't going to come in there at all, but all right. just listening to the, the detailed information and presentation, thank everybody uh, for that. Just in summary, if, if I could ask the, the presenters there, the departmental officials, what would you regard as the single uppermost major challenge stroke problem facing you at the moment? Uh, from from my perspective, and it's only a personal perspective rather than an agency perspective, but I think the biggest challenge facing um, our river systems and, and our ecosystems is climate change and the extremes of climate change that we're seeing. Um, I, I'm sure that, that uh, that that thought is probably echoed amongst um, my colleagues, but I say that that's my own personal view as opposed to the agency view. I mean, my view too. Um, <laughs> does, does, does anyone else want to come in on that, just? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer that one. Passy, it's a very interesting question, I have to say. Um, I, I suppose for me, and again, it's a personal view, it's, it's, it's how we as a society balance um, the, the clear impacts there are ac across across our environment uh, and protecting it, but at the same time um, recognising that we, we all want a particular um, lifestyle and a, and, a, and a particular type of well-being and we want to be able to exercise and, and enjoy the outside as well. So it's how, it's how the challenge for me is how we balance that in, in a way which is actually sustainable in the fullest sense of the word going forward. But again, okay. that's a, per a personal view. Yeah, well, 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 maybe a personal view is good because it informs uh, what we're doing and thank you for that um and rolling that on through how do you feel you can dovetail your experiences efforts and expertise into uh, policy development through the department well my, my, my particular role patsy is is, is on is, is in relation to protected sites and we've been talking about um, several river systems today mm -hmm. so for for me, um, it's 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 how do we use the, the, the policy frameworks which are there, the legislation that's there, and the opportunities um, that, that are coming along in terms of um, potential sources of funding and so on. That actually we, we are able to get these river systems um, back into a much a much more sustainable footing, a much more natural uh, footing, so that everybody can enjoy the benefits um, of those systems, okay. including nature itself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, Patsy. Thank, thank you. you. Um, okay, um, j just before I uh, just conclude there, uh, I just want to make just make a couple of points there. Uh, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I want to also say that um, th through my own involvement in, in, in Loughan Grey, um, I'm very very familiar with the work that, that the Lock City does in terms of education, outreach, and indeed uh, increasing access. Uh, to angling and uh, other um, you know, to rivers and, and to the lakes. Um, I, I want to also say that um, uh, I'm glad that your new office in Oma is, is progressing as well. And I should say that um, in the aftermath of the, the floods in the, in the, the Nelly area in 2017, Lux Agency played a fantastic role on the ground, um, working with those farmers, engaging with them, assessing the damage of it and um, uh, and indeed um, uh, had a lot of engagement with one of your officials, Seamus Cullinan at the time, uh, who worked very, very closely, particularly with the farming community, who, who are still obviously um, labouring under the, the damage caused in that and, and obviously it's something that we've been lobbying the Minister in terms of, you know, looking to support those farmers and that's something that will keep uh, going on. But in terms of, of rolling out that scheme, you know, um, I'm looking at some of the statistics there you provided. You know the 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 um, the new the, the scheme the the flood scheme that 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 you that you rolled out the remedial flood project, 35 kilometres of fencing, 104 access gates. You know that that's a big project, so it is, and and Lux Agency uh, led from the front on that on the ground in that uh, Glenelly area in the in the aftermath of, of the flooding. So um, you are to be to commend for that there, and just want to just place on record our, our thanks and recognition for the work you just did on the ground, uh, particularly at that time. So, thank you yes. very much. Then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, OK, thank then. Um, and, sure, listen, we'll, we'll be in contact, and uh, no doubt we'll be having future engagements.
in the time ahead. So thank you, uh, John, JP, and Mark. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, folks. We're moving on to item six in your agenda. It's a an oral briefing from the department and common frameworks. There's a memo from the clerk and the table papers and a written briefing from the department to page 51 to 77. I want to welcome by Starleaf, um, Rosemary Agnew, the Brexit Director, uh, Julianne Moorhead, Brexit Senior Advisor. And I'd like to ask uh, Rosemary and Julianne to begin their briefing and then members will obviously want to pick up on some questions thereafter. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning. Um, I assume you can hear me okay? Yes, Rosemary. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity this morning, really, to discuss the Common Frameworks Programme and to try to provide an update on our discussions, um, which we had previously on the 10th of September. Um, you referred in your introduction, Chair, to the written update on the process and um, the annex attached to that with the current position on each of the frameworks. The detailed responses to your questions regarding the frameworks have been provided by the actual DARA policy leads. And it's my intention this morning really to provide you with an overview of the development process and the next steps, not the details of each framework that will come later. Um, so as the committee is aware, the process for common frameworks is to set out a common agreed approach to how the UK government and the devolved administrations will work together in areas that were previously governed by EU law, but are within the competence now of the devolved administrations. So as a consequence of a reclassification exercise that I referred to in my previous update, DERA is the lead Northern Ireland Civil Service Department for 15 of the 39 frameworks. Um, 13 of the 15 are within the EFRA or the DEFRA-led um, area and two are within the base portfolio. Frameworks, um, as the committee will be aware, are designed to meet the principles agreed by the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU negotiations, which were later endorsed by the Northern Ireland Executive. These include things like ensuring that the arrangements support the effective working of the UK internal market, the management of shared resources, the ability to sign new trade deals, and the meeting of international commitments, just to give a few examples. The frameworks also respect the devolution settlements and maintain levels of flexibility for different approaches within each region of the United Kingdom, while allowing also for divergence where it's appropriate and acknowledging very specifically the different circumstances apply to Northern Ireland, given that the Northern Ireland Protocol applies to Northern Ireland and we remain aligned um, to EU regulations for goods. It's important that a UK uh, approach to frameworks is maintained and that Northern Ireland interests are accounted for, even where the operation of the framework could be at a GB level. And that's very important given the extent of NI to GB and GB to NI trade that currently exists. Um, saying a little bit then about phase three and, and where we currently are, um, the key focus of the Common Frameworks program in the last few months has been the completion of a phase three of a five phase um, development process to establish the provisional frameworks by the end of the transition period or the 31st of December just passed. The provisional frameworks are minimally operable frameworks that have undergone collaborative policy development peer review and were appropriate external sector specific stakeholder engagement. Phase three of the five phase process for framework development is almost complete with 14 of the 15 frameworks on which DEFRA lead awaiting JMCEN provisional endorsement. Still to reach um, that uh, final stage or that stage is the framework for organics. It has completed a phase three review assessment and will shortly be submitted to um, the interministerial EFRA group for ministerial clearance. And hopefully that will be followed by JMCEN endorsement. During phase three, the DERA policy leads initiated engagement with the committee on the majority of the frameworks through sharing of framework summaries and provisional of 
provision of technical briefing when requested by the committee. My understanding is that to date, um, 12 summaries um, have been shared with you around the frameworks and there have been six oral briefings and four written briefings. Um, you might want to correct me on that, but that's my current understanding. The purpose of this was to assist you, to assist you in deciding the level of scrutiny that would be required during phase four of the development process. A very similar approach has been adopted by Scottish government officials and by, the, by their Welsh counterparts, um, but the Welsh counterparts are currently seeking ministerial clearance to share the frameworks with the Welsh Senate. Um, moving on to say a little bit about phase four quite quickly. Um, once the provisional frameworks have been endorsed by JMCEN, the frameworks will move formally to phase four of this five-stage development process, which will involve the scrutiny by each administration. It would be our intention, um, subject to agreement across um, the other administrations, to share the provisional frameworks with the committee once JMCEN ministerial confirmation is received. Um, at this point in time, I can't give you a timeline for when that JMCEN um, agreement or confirmation will be agreed, um, but we will keep you updated on progress. Um, and as I've said, the intention is as far as possible to keep this coordinated across the four administrations of the United Kingdom so that scrutiny occurs in a parallel um, way across those administrations. I have to mention that the timeline for the progress of the frameworks um, overall will also need to take account of elections in the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Senate in the spring, along with the response to and the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic and the very extensive competing priorities or significant competing priorities um, from EU exit. And certainly this week, we've had discussions with the other devolved administrations around those competing priorities around EU exit and the impact of that on this overall frameworks programme. And it is something that the ministers from the four jurisdictions will discuss when they meet on Monday for their monthly IMG meeting. Phase four um, will involve further framework development as, as the impact of cross-cutting dependencies are analysed and those cross-cutting dependencies agree, for example, the unilateral um, decisions on how the Northern Ireland Protocol will be implemented, um, the implications of the Internal Market Act, and the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Conclusions of the review of intergovernmental relations, known as the IGR review, um, which was commissioned by the Joint Ministerial Committee in 2018, will also need to be considered in the context of frameworks. Now, unfortunately, that IGR has not yet reported, so the conclusions of that review are unknown at this point. Um, so for some of the frameworks, um, also further stakeholder engagement will need to take place during phase four, and parliamentary recommendations to finalize the individual frameworks and the approval process prior to the implementation will require ministerial agreement, Northern Ireland Executive Agreement for all cross-cutting frameworks and JMCEN confirmation. Having said all of that, Chair, I come towards the end of what I want to say as part of my introduction, and I apologise for talking about all of these phases, but it's really been critical to try to get an understanding of where we are and understand the overall process. So following completion of phase four, we move to phase five, um, which are the post-implementation arrangements, um, and along, alongside of that, any arrangements for review. These will vary between the frameworks and details continue to be developed. And again, we'll keep the committee updated as those become available. So Chair, thank you for your time. Um, I'll, I'll finish my introduction at this stage, and Julianne and I are happy to take any questions you have at this stage. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rosemary, uh, um, reflecting back here, Rosemary, do you see that in relation to some of the um, CFs, um, they're not they're not connected to the protocol, uh, and so in that situation, we'll be following the lead uh, from um, the Westminster side. 
Now, see in a situation where the UK will d- diverge, um, say, o- over time, um, you know, w- what impact could that, could, could that have for c- certainly our relationships across the EU and indeed across the island here? Um, I suppose that will depend on which particular area you're speaking about or you're referring to. And and I would suggest, Chair, that that's probably best addressed by each of the policy leads when they come to provide you with more details. But you are undoubtedly correct that there is potential that, and I'll refer to it as GB, could diverge. Um, It will have implications potentially for trade. Um, It will have implications then back into things like agricultural support where our environmental standards are. But the focus of having a common framework is try is to try to give time, first of all, um, for each, if an administration is deciding to diverge, for discussion prior to the decision to diverge, to look at those impacts and try to mitigate, them against, mitigate against them in each of the other devolved administrations. It doesn't prevent divergence, but it tries to provide a forum to mitigate against unintended consequences or impacts in the other administrations and there are dispute resolution mechanisms set within each individual framework which ultimately would, could go to ministers and um, if that dispute cannot be resolved and um, not sure chair if that answers your question but it's probably the best i can do for now no no that's that's, that's very helpful rosemary thank you um and just before i, I, I move on around there's a couple of members have indicated them all speak uh, to, just on a, on a point of um of information. See, in terms of, um, am I right in saying that the com framework doesn't they don't doesn't necessarily need our approval before it moves on to phase four? Well, well, is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, I'll just check with Julianne. Um, but yes, that that is my understanding. That is correct. Um, but obviously, we welcome your scrutiny of it, and that is part of what we would want you to do um, or ask you to do, and con- alongside um, the parallel. Uh, constitutional administrations or the administrations in the other parts of the United Kingdom. But approval for the various phases is via um, the ministerial groups that I've previously mentioned, including the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, And I think, obviously, you you would feed into that Northern Ireland Executive approval process. Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you, Rosemary. Um, John? Uh, sure, thank you, Rosemary. Thank you um, for, for today and for the uh, work you and the team have done on this uh, right throughout this, <laughs> what must have seemed a very lengthy process. Um, the uh, Rosemary, the thing that comes to mind is, mindful of the resource the department has dedicated to this already and is doing so currently, I'm thinking of the, um, the, the issues that are arising through EU exit and changes that might have to be made um, within that process and, of course, the protocol as well. Thinking of the uh, contact members here will be getting over the movement of pets, for example, and assistance animals. Um, You'll be aware that there's been uh, other changes made regarding uh, import of cars, secondhand cars, um, issues arising over VAT on steel. So I'm wondering, is there a huge amount of work required if changes have to be made to the frameworks? in relation to any changes that are forthcoming? And how how is that being analysed? You mentioned many of the topical issues, um, John, and and obviously as we move forward more and there are more issues that appear that need to be resolved. And we're working as a department very, very hard to try to resolve any issues that are are raised with us. And um, department is very much focused on delivering a workable solution to all of these and ensuring that the flow of goods wherever that flow is continues in as unhindered a way as possible and you'll be very aware of our minister's position on all of this Um, but in terms of the frameworks the frameworks are really a way in which the administrations work together to try to avoid having unintended consequences by decisions in the future so they will require work Um, I think the extent of that work will very much depend on the area um, and on the issue itself that arises. But department is very uh, alert to the fact that it will require significant resource moving forward. 
this is setting up how the United Kingdom will work with each other to try to protect that United Kingdom internal market um, and ensure it remains functioning. But that will be driven by commercial decisions by businesses around their supply chains as well, which in itself will bring additional work to the frameworks. So straight, simple answer to your question is, there is a huge amount of work ahead of us. We're very aware of that, um, certainly in discussions at a senior level and, and within the overall transition program, which the permanent secretary has updated on you and updated uh, with you in recent meetings. Department continually rebases that, looks at the priorities, tries to prioritize its work. Um, I've already mentioned frameworks are probably not progressing at the speed across the United Kingdom that we had initially intended because we have to deal with these operational issues to make keep products flowing. So very long way of saying we'll require additional resource. We don't have a line of sight on that yet. It is a very fluid situation and we're trying to manage it. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Philip McGuigan is taking the chair. Can I ask Combs to bring Philip in as chair, please? Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Uh, Harry, you're next. Yep, appreciate it, Philip. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just wondering, Rosemary, do officials have any feeling for which of the 15 frameworks may prove most burdensome for or difficult for DERA to operate or implement? Thank you. <sighs> Probably, I, if Harry, I would just be giving you my my view or my personal view at the minute. If we look at the ones that have the biggest impact around the issues that concern us most, there are a number of um, environmental frameworks, and um, particularly if other regions of NGB would diverge, and those would cause us some issue, particularly given the direction of travel that has been outlined that as a department uh, and as a Northern Ireland executive. Um, we wish to move. Um, I think as well the fisheries framework in itself is difficult yeah. given that there's no real boundaries in water. You know, water doesn't have a line. Um, and I suppose I have to say the agricultural framework could potentially cause us some difficulties given the likely divergence that will appear as we move forward on future agricultural policy in the different uh, areas of the United Kingdom. Um, Julianne, I don't know if you want to add anything to that um, or anything that you're aware of in relation to any other potentially um, difficult areas? No, Rosemary, I agree. I, we do have some priority frameworks that we have listed um, in relation to importance to trade, but I agree with your assessment. Okay, thank you, Julianne. Thank you, Rosemary. Okay, thanks, Philip. Okay, thank you, Harry. Uh, William, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair, um, and thank you for your presentation. In relation to Internal market within the UK, we know how vital that is to Northern Ireland, given that a vast amount of our produce goes to the mainland. And uh, the difficulties, we don't see them as much difficult at the moment there, but the difficulties seem to be the other way around. Imports bringing material and goods back into Northern Ireland. Uh, what's your view on who... Uh, I, I'm just giving you an instance of one um, farm supplier contacted me the other day and the cost, he brings in 8 tonne of dog food per month and it's now cost him £200 extra, £25 a tonne extra to import that. Who's liable, is government, is the UK government liable to cover the costs, the extra costs involved? There was a sort of a promise made at one stage, do you know is that right or not? Um, I'm probably not close enough to your particular example, uh, William, but um, there were indications that UK government would certainly cover the co additional costs. And I know the Dairy Minister has been very active in reminding the UK government that they promised to cover those additional costs to business. Um, I am not cited on whether that has progressed or not, but it's certainly something I know that our minister raises on a very, very regular basis. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a, it is a big issue for some firms, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the other issue is um, there are there are a number of firms in England uh, we're looking to supply something seeds and etc. to Northern Ireland. It is an issue, so there is a lot of issues to be resolved. 
Yes, um, William, I do agree. And I think in my answer to one of the other members, we do recognise that there are issues and it's only when you get to that particular good, and I'll call it good, whether it be, a, as you mentioned, a vegetable seed or a dog food or cat food or something else that you totally really understand um, the impact of the change as a result of the end of the transition period and the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, Minister is very, very alert to all of these issues and has been extremely active in raising the issues to try to get a resolution. Um, and some of them have been mentioned during this committee meeting where there has been some success in gaining something that is more manageable um, uh, in, to take us towards a sort of a a direction or a, a compliance direction towards compliance um, to allow businesses time to adjust. But it is a huge change um, and I think it's something that we're all becoming very, very aware of as we move forward. Okay. Okay. Um, can the comms just note that I'm back in as to chair here? Uh, Philip? Chair, uh, thank you for getting me in. Just, I mean, the witnesses have said that there, there are frameworks, there, sorry, there are priority frameworks regarding trade. Just, I mean, can I just ask if, what, what those are? Uh, certainly, Philip, if I could ask Julianne just to give you a list of those. Certainly. Um, chemicals and pesticides, fisheries management and support, resources and waste, plant health, emissions trading scheme, agricultural support, plant varieties and seeds, and animal health and welfare, and those are in particular, no particular ranking order. And, and I think if I could just add to that, Philip, those were also agreed as priority frameworks um, by the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, and certainly if that information isn't with the committee, we're very happy to follow up with that list and we can provide that list to committee members. Okay, I think that would be useful. Thank you, Chair. Up, Rosemary. Yeah, thank you, Rosemary. Thank you for your presentation. Um, what is the impact the protocols going to have in respect to the framework's process, particularly if the framework is going to be a GB framework? Will DERA have any impact into it? Thank you, Rosemary. Obviously, we want still to be engaged if it is a GB-only framework, but we very much recognise that the requirements of the protocol could result in divergence, as we've already mentioned, between Northern Ireland and GB over time. Um, as the rules in Northern Ireland change um, in alignment with the EU and GB rules change over time, because even within Northern Ireland, the rules will not remain static over time. We will have to remain aligned to the EU. So there is very much a potential for divergence over a period of time. Exactly how the protocol will impact on the common frameworks uh, and their operation does need much further detailed discussion and consideration because as you're aware, many of the decisions around the implementation of the protocol have come very late in the day. And the agreement on the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement also came very late on the day. But in broad terms, the frameworks help to manage any potential divergence um, between ANI and GB in, in two ways. The first of those is where one or more of the administrations in GB propose a change in rules in a way that will not be possible in Northern Ireland. The common framework is intended to provide a governance structure and a consensus-based process to consider and manage that divergence over time. So it's really this discussion that I referred to earlier. As the rules of all, really, in both um, under the protocol or, or under the EU and GB decides if it does to diverge. Secondly, um, where rules in Northern Ireland change in alignment uh, with the EU, frameworks should form the basis of a mechanism to ensure consideration by the four administrations of any changes taking place in Northern Ireland and any potential impact that would have on GB. So it will work both ways is really what I'm trying to say to you. But the processes are there to try to discuss and manage that um, at official level, then at a senior official level, and ultimately at a ministerial level. And those processes are set up within all of the frameworks. Okay, thank you. And in relation to those common frameworks, what ones do you see that are most, most likely to be affected by divergence? 
I suppose I would have to say all, most of the priority ones that Julianne mentioned, but if we particularly look at the ones that I'd mentioned previously, the environmental ones, um, where there are lots of EU regulations, although there is a non-regression clause in the EU um, UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, um, which at least should keep uh, GB at the same level as it is currently. But if EU moves, Northern Ireland will move with that under EU regulations. Um, equally, there are all of those that relate to trade, and, and Julianne has given you those priority frameworks that are that are impacted by trade. So I think there's potential for any um, of the priority ones to be impacted by divergence. Yeah, and then as a follow up to that, um, do you think it'll it'll make European the European Health Certificate or the Customs Declaration processes more difficult? I think I would have to say an answer to that. I hope not. Um, and we'll just have to probably wait and see. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. And Claire? Good evening, Chair. Um, and thanks. I think, Rosemary, you've pointed to a few issues in terms of even delivery or getting the agreement or how slow this process has been. Um, and I'm just sort of then thinking about the the... EU UK trade deal that was signed off on the 30th of December last year there. Um, does that have an impact on the framework process specifically? Um, and do you feel that it may cause the four administrations to revisit any particular areas of the frameworks? I think, uh, Claire, it doesn't change it per se, but it changes the context in which the framework will need to operate in. So it changes the context, as as do the decisions um, around the implementation of the protocol. So the overall context has to change. And obviously, um, as, as business areas move forward in their discussions and policy areas on particular issues, I think it will need to be brought in and it will need to, um, it will impact perhaps not on how the framework operates but on the decisions that are necessary as part of the framework process because the frameworks are really a process by which the four administrations of the uk will work together to try to mitigate against negative impacts or unintended consequences primarily on each each region or each other so the pro the process won't necessarily change but the context of the process has changed as a result yeah so then i'm putting that in the context then we have Scotland and Wales going to elections next year and they will have you know whatever results they bring as well are you foreseeing that post elections there that the context could change again and then the following year Northern Ireland's going to have elections we're going to have assembly elections here and then we're moving into another electoral cycle for Westminster so this continual electoral cycles um, do you see that that's going to continually change the context of the frameworks or is that something that's being considered? Well, first of all, it can, it will change the context um, because obviously, depending what happens in each administration, um, different political masters have different uh, directions of travel. So it will change the overall context. It won't necessarily change the process. And that's why during my introductory uh, presentation to you, I talked about a review. So there will be review phases put in at different stages as to how the frameworks are actually working in the different contexts. Um, but it's an overall process by which there would be open and frank discussion, firstly between officials as to what's going on in each administration, then through senior officials and through IMG, really to try to mitigate against any unintended consequences. And the context, while it's changing all the time, doesn't change the process that is caught in the middle of all of this. If, if that makes any sense to you, Claire. I don't think it makes much sense to me. No, people, Rosemary, but, no but then I suppose my final um, point on that one is how workable do you really feel or how sustainable can these frameworks be? You know, if the context will be continually changing, if it will be continually reviewed and revisited, you know, do you not find that this is going to be a burdensome, burdensome bur I can't say, burdensome process? You know, it, it's... I, I'm just foreseeing, you know, right across the UK regions, if we're constantly reviewing, revisiting, changing the context, um, looking at where each administration's priority lies, you know, how sustainable and workable will any of this be? 
Well, I suppose in reality, Claire, time will tell on that. And if, uh, to try to give you a bit, I suppose, more reassurance, the one that I lead on is the agricultural support one. And, and the, that's probably the one I can talk about in a little bit more detail. Already under that agricultural support framework, we have set up a policy coordination group where the four regions of the UK talk about what they might be doing or will talk about what they might be doing in future agricultural policy to look at, first of all, their directions of travel, where there could be a positive impact on the other administrations or where there could be a negative impact. There's also another group which will be set up called a market monitoring group, which will look at the impact of any or the potential impact of any changes on policies on the market prices of the various agricultural products. And then thirdly, another group will be set up looking at uh, cross-border holdings and the impact on cross-border holdings. Now, obviously, there are very few cross-border holdings between Northern Ireland and GB. There are a few. It relies, it's more about the Scotland-England cross-border holding or the England-Welsh cross-border holding. But there are groups set up underneath it, at least to have conversations well ahead of time to try to avoid unintended consequences moving forward. I think in simple answer to you and, and your direct question, we will only find out in time how well these work or don't work. Um, but there must be something um, because at the minute, you know, we are still part of the United Kingdom. Um, we have to align to EU rule, EU rules for goods. Um, and previously, we were the United Kingdom because the EU policy was repatriated to the UK, and now these are coming into devolved spaces. So we must just tread cautiously and carefully. But the Common Frameworks is a process around how we try to manage divergence or dispute resolution, rather than the policy per se. So I hope that's helpful, Claire. I <laughs> hope it's helpful for you, Rosemary Moore. <laughs> but see, in terms of the cross-border element, you're talking about the cross-border stuff at, at, at the GB level. Um, how how much, do you, or if at all, you know, would the Irish government have to be involved or um, engaged in terms of the uh, Irish cross-border elements of that? I mean, we were, for example, just hearing from the LOCKS agency there, um, and that's, you know, huge amount of work uh, and issues that they deal with. Uh, for Northern Ireland, um, but also with the Irish government. Is that creating extra complexities with the frameworks? Yes, and you're absolutely right to raise that because, and, and, and I only heard the end of the LOX agency presentation there, but as the policy teams move forward in developing the frameworks, they have to consider Northern Ireland and ensure the framework isn't at odds, for example, with the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and it doesn't conflict with decisions taken by the North-South implementation bodies. So that's part of the overall context they have to work in. And these questions, um, along with others about the position of Northern Ireland, were actually tested um, in a review process, an independent review of, done by assessment panels at the end of phase three, and a series of questions were posed to each of the framework leads around that as to how they were going to handle that. And my expectation would be that if um, the committee are to receive oral updates on each of the individual frameworks by the business areas that that will be covered as part of that presentation in detail about that framework. But it can't it can't be left out because it doesn't make sense to leave it out. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks a million. Okay. Uh, Morris. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Chair, just just a comment really on on the. Uh, and the various phases, I mean, the 21 days, I think, think is realistic. Uh, and if there's going to be elections in Scotland and Wales, that may give us an opportunity to extend our 21 day limit. Uh, is the way I read it anyway, that we could maybe uh, extend that a bit and have a bit more time to scrutinize these things. Uh, I've concerns about the protocol, as I'm sure we all have, but one of the main reasons many people voted to leave the EU uh, was because of the bureaucracy and the red tape and the cumbersome nature of the of the EU. Uh, can I ask, in the convergences, are, are we still going to be burdened uh, by that red tape uh, and bureaucracy from the EU and further impeded by further red tape and, and disadvantage from the Northern Ireland Protocol or the Ireland Protocol? It, 
it seems to be that Northern Ireland are going to be disadvantaged on two sides, on the EU side, which we have no control over their legislation, and on the GB side, where we have now got a, a barrier between ourselves and the rest of the mainland. Um, as you're aware, um, Morris, because Northern Ireland is under the protocol, we have to align to EU regulations. But we are outside of the common agricultural policy and we are outside of the common fisheries policy. So um, on the common agricultural policy, Derek Minister has already announced a number of simplifications, um, a number of, dare I say, improvement simplifications to the 2021 scheme year. Um, because moving forward, we will have our own um, agricultural policy and our own, hopefully, agricultural regulations setting that forward. Equally, the same should apply to the common fisheries policy. But having set that aside, we still have to remain aligned to EU regulations. We are under the Northern Ireland Protocol. In Northern Ireland, we are treated as if we are part of the EU single market, whereas GB is now a third country. So there are still um, processes which legally have to take place um, in order to meet those regulations. And that's where certainly you, all of you as committee members are now aware of checks on various things that perhaps didn't receive checks before um, coming into Northern Ireland. So I think there's still an element of EU bureaucracy which will remain because we are aligned and equally, we have to remain aligned as we move forward, unless the Northern Ireland executive decides um, in four years' time to vote that we come out of the protocol. Um, we will remain aligned. One of the big areas coming forward is the new EU animal health law. And I'm not sure if the committee has had an update on that yet. But that will bring new requirements under EU animal health, which have to be brought into force in Northern Ireland and not in the rest of GB. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> It doesn't make it any easier and make the problems uh, go away. What you're saying really, in effect, is that if the EU change their legislation through di divergence, that we in Northern Ireland, without having any input uh, to those change in regulations, are then duty bound by those regulations. Mm -hmm. what, what, yes. you're saying, what you're saying is the EU is Germany uh, and we're Poland. We've been overrun, basically. <laughs> Well, well I, I, won't comment, I won't comment on Germany and Poland, but you're absolutely right. Under the Northern Ireland Protocol, we remain aligned to EU rules, but we have no in input as we did, ha did have previously via the UK as, as part of a, member, a real member state into how those are changed. We will have input perhaps at official level, but we are no longer in those negotiations per se. Now, you would like to think as well, uh, Morris, that there could be opportunities of being part of the EU single market and there could be opportunities for trade into GB via the unfettered market access that um, is there within the command paper and within the Internal Market Act. So you would like to think that moving forward, there will be opportunities both for businesses to trade in both directions and to enhance that trade. But I can't go away from the fact we remain aligned to EU regulations and we need to comply with those and we have lost our uh, main voice in the negotiations of those regulations or the formative stages of those negotiations moving forward in terms of what those regulations will say. Thank you very much for that, Rosa. A uh, uh, difficult situation that we find ourselves in and the only way out of it is if the executive takes the decision sometime in the future to... Uh, Get rid of the protocol somehow. But anyway, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Morris. Okay, uh, Patrick. Thanks very much, Chair. The only observation I'll say on what Morris said there is if uh, those who are negotiating on one side pay as much attention to it as they did to the, the trade agreement on fisheries and didn't read the document, then uh, I think people could be in a, a bit of a pickle. But uh, if I could say just on in relation, Rosemary, what I'm, what I'm working through is, and, I, and I'm hearing you about the process, the administrative process, the, the exchanging of management of, of four regions throughout this all. Um, however, <clears throat> this, is, this is the point I want to come to. Um, we have a very heavy reliance on agri-food and agriculture production. That isn't the situation, and certainly in, in other... In, in, um, other regions such as Scotland, Wales or England for, for a fact. Now, 
at, at what point does that emphasis stroke reliance that we have on the agri-food sector here become a point at which there's divergence as opposed to compliance and uh, consistency and how do you well i'd be really shocked and surprised if you hadn't foreseen this issue um how do you arrive or by what mechanism sorry the mechanism is already there by what method do you foresee dealing with that issue at either a management civil service level or a policy level to ensure that there that uh, there is consistency of approach there well i think my initial reply to patsy would would be that the mechanism um, and the method should be there to deal with it you're absolutely correct that um the reliance on agri-food in Northern Ireland is much, much more significant than it is in other uh, regions of the United Kingdom. Um, we export a significant amount of our food um, or our agri-food products. Um, that is linked to future agricultural support policy, which is a devolved competence and which sits solely within the gift of the minister and the Northern Ireland executive as to where we go with that. That is a completely devolved competency. So part of the protection there for the heavy reliance on agri-food should come moving forward with that agricultural support policy. Um, and as time goes on, I'm sure the committee will receive updates um, from the minister and ourselves around where the intention would be to go with that. But having said all of that, it will be a, almost a watch and see what happens um, because at the minute, uh, many businesses and the committee is well aware are learning the new processes they need to comply with, yes. both in terms of importing into Northern Ireland and now exporting out of Northern Ireland. Um, and we're very, very alert to all of those. So it's very much a, a, a watch trying to preempt. Um, I've already talked about um, the frameworks needing to have the overall context of whatever the trade agreements are and julianne has mentioned the priority frameworks in relation to trade so minister's focus will very much be on those priority frameworks and the influence that they could have on trade as we move forward and the reliance on agri-food uh, can you give me a few examples of what you may have preempted in regard to the, this particular issue well i think we, we haven't necessarily preempted anything because we are still moving forward but um to give you a few examples of what what would be in my thoughts as we would move forward, we need to protect um, the export markets that we have for agri-food moving forward. We need to ensure that material can, that those just-in-time deliveries can move forward and they are part of ongoing discussions even now within sort of a common frameworks arena as to where those uh, what we need to do to mitigate or to better alert businesses to what needs to be done. So there are there are impacts. Obviously, um, the protocol um, and what it requires, as we've already talked about, and the relationship with um, ROI also needs to come on board. And there are a number of discussions initiated through the North South. Uh, mechanism that exists to take that forward. So I'm not perhaps giving you examples because I think they are specific to each individual framework. Um, and I would suggest that as we move forward, you actually ask the policy leads on each individual framework and um, that specific question um, as, as things progress. That's grand. OK, thanks. Thanks now, Rosemary. Um, OK. So, folks, uh, as we have no other members down looking to speak, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Rosemary and Julianne for your for your contributions uh, this morning, and uh, no doubt we'll be hearing from you again. So, thank you. Uh, okay, thank folks. you very much, Chair. No problem. You're very welcome. Okay, folks, I'm going to move on here now to uh, item item seven on your on your agenda. Um, it's a departmental written briefing on the, the horses regulations 2020. The memo from the track is page 79 to 80 in the papers from the department 81 to 86. I want to advise members that the committee first consider the regulations at the, our meeting on the 10th of December when we agreed that the committee was content with the merits of the policy and it should move to the next stage. 
The regulations will amend domestic legislation relating to equine access to competition to enable DERA to reserve a portion of the prize money from certain categories of competitions for specific purposes and will introduce Council Directive 9428EZ, which prohibits discrimination in relation to equine competitions with regard to the rules of entry, <coughs> judging and awarding of prize money. <coughs> the, legal, the regulations are subject to negative resolution, come into operation on the 31st of December 2020 and are in breach of the 21 day rule. The ESR has not yet reported on the regulations but has indicated that there appears to be a technical issue with the numbering. It has been laid in the Assembly as SR 2023-28 but appears on the official legislation website as both 328 and 329. The issue is being resolved but the ESR has no other concerns with the ESR. Um, okay. Members okay if I put the question? Um, the Committee of Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs okay. considered SR 2020 328, the horses free access to competitions, amendment regulations NA 2020, subject to examiner's statutory report. There's no objections to the rule. Okay. Item 8 in your agenda is a, um, is a, a um, written briefing from the Department on the SR 202345, the producer. Responsibility Obligations Packaging Waste Amendment Regulations NA 2020. The memo from the clerk is page 8889 and papers from the Department at 90 to 100. One of those members of the regulations were first considered by the committee uh, on the 17th of December. While she was content that, with the merits of the policy and that it should move to the next legislative stage, members asked for verification on whether these regulations will continue to follow EU law. Deer responded that by virtue of the packaging and waste, the packaging and packaging waste directive list being listed in Annex Two to the protocol, the producer responsibility or obligations packaging waste regulations NA 2007 is amended, must and will continue to transpose and follow EU law. The rule is subject to negative resolution uh, procedure and come into operation the 11th of January, the 2021. The examiner statutory rules is reported um, on the regulations and does not draw any attention to it on any grounds. Uh, members are um, content to put the question. The Committee for Agriculture and Environment Rural Affairs has considered SR 2023 45, the Responsibility Obligations, Packaging Waste Amendment Regulations uh, NR 2020. No objections are in. Rosemary, do you want your objection recorded? Those are objections recorded, okay? Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, number nine in your uh, packs is the Department Briefing SR 2023 59, the Marketing of Seed Potatoes Plant Propagating Material. Regulations NA 2020. One of those members of the ESR intends to report on the statutory rule next week. And if members are content, I will defer consideration to that meeting. Okay. Uh, item 10 is a written briefing, SR 202360. The Official Controls Plant Protection Products Regulations 2020. The ESR intends to report on the statutory rule next week. And if members are content, intend to defer consideration to that meeting. Okay. Against that. Sorry? Against that. Try. Against item 10. Oh, that's fine. Right. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh -huh. Note that. Uh, well, not be put in the next week, but you can note it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yeah, item 11 is a written briefing. Um, the SR 2020 324, the Agriculture, Animals and Aquaculture, Aquaculture Health, Identification, Welfare and Trade. Amendment EU Exit Regulations NA 2020. I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at pages 134 to 137 and from the Department of 138 to 149. I advise members that the SL1 considered by the committee on the 22nd of October 2020, at which stage members indicate they were content with the merits of the policy. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure. The rule ensures that subordinate legislation relating to animal health and welfare alien and locally absent species in agriculture, common marketing organisation and common agriculture policy can continue to operate effectively following the transition period in alliance with EU obligations in these areas in accordance with protocol. The SR makes a number of amendments which are consequential to those made to primary legislation in the Plant Health and Diseases of Animals Amendment EU Exit Regulation 2020. NI states that the, DERA states that the rule um, provides that the stamps applied in slaughterhouse or game handling establishments to untreated meat from animals restricted because of a disease outbreak must bear the identification mark UK NI as opposed to the current UK mark reflecting the requirements of Article 7 of the protocol. 
Further, the rule provides that EU Commission officials may only attend premises in this jurisdiction in relation to direct payments where payments have been claimed prior to 2020 because they are, not, they are nationally funded from 2020 onwards. However, it also, it also provides for ongoing access for European Commission officials which may be required for schemes under the Rural Development Programme in line with the terms of the withdrawal agreement. The ESR has reported the statute ruling does not draw any attention on any grounds. Members, any comments you want to make about that? Um, okay, so any comments, any objections, or any comments written to us here? Yeah, I'll be no, fine. I'm against well. it because yep. of the protocol. Okay, um, well, I think there's no, you know, it's a continuation. Uh, we can't do out the legislation. That's yeah. the difficulty, I think. If we all voted against it, we'd, uh, there would be no legislation in place. <coughs> you know, so. so We've noted Rosen's objection, and then I'll put the question that the Committee of Agriculture, Environment and Affairs concerned SR 2023 24, Agriculture, Animals and Aquaculture, Aquaculture uh, Amendment, EU Exit Regulation NA 2020, and um, had no objection, albeit Rosemary's objection. No. Okay. Are we okay with that there? Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, okay item 10 is the. Uh, uh, and your, or sorry, item 12 on your agenda. Yeah, item 12 on your agenda is the uh, SR 2020 the Animals Health Identification Trade and Veterinary Medicines Amendment EU Exit Regulations NA 2020. The ESR intends to report on the statute rule next week, and members are okay. We will defer considering this until next week when the ES, the examiner statute rules reports. Okay. I want to advise members that items th uh, 13 to 15 are statutory rules that the committee had previously agreed be affirmed by the Assembly. Each rule was subject to draft affirmative procedure. The Assembly has now affirmed each rule and the committee is asked today to note receipt of the rules. I said okay. Is there a uh, memo from Stella at page 169? Um, M13 is a written briefing from DERA, the Plant and Animal Health Amendment EU Exit Regulations. Uh, 2020, uh, papers in the Department 170 um, to 177. Um, can we note, note receipt of the rule made? Okay. Um, dear uh, written briefing, SR 2020 to 333, the Alien and Locally Absent Species, EU Exit Regulations NA 2020, papers from the Department 179 to 185. Can we note, rec note receipt of the made rule? Okay. Um, uh, written briefing, 20, item 15 on your agenda. Uh, written briefing, SR 2023-39, the marketing of plant and propagating material, amendment to EU exit regulations NA 2020. The papers in the department are page 187 to 195. Can we note proceed to this? That's the main rule. Okay. Okay, um, item 16. Written briefing from DERA on the avian flu, uh, avian influenza, um, outbreak in um, 2020, 2021. Uh, the written briefing from the department on the outbreak is at page 197 to 201. I want to advise members that the department has advised that to date there have been eight positive cases of avian influenza confirmed in wild birds here across five different locations, locations as well as confirmation on two commercial poultry holdings. These notifiable avian disease outbreaks in poultry are the, are, are the first here since 1998 and the first ever involving a highly pathogenic strain of the virus. The Department advises that it has detailed contingency plans for handling the outbreaks of exotic disease. The aim of the current contingency planning process is to prepare a comprehensive response encompassing all aspects of resource and planning necessary for the control and eradication of ep Episodic disease. The plans deal the emergent deals with the emergency command and communication arrangements and the measures adopted to deal with suspected cases, control and eradication, or episodic uh, disease confirmed in recovery, declaring disease freedom. Dear advisor that has robust disease surveillance programmes in place, compliant with the EU reg legislation, to help prevent incursion of the major episodic diseases which includes targeted and passive surveillance and portal checks on animals arriving into this area. Um, avian influenza has the potential to have a significant impact on our poultry industry, international trade and the wider economy. Demonstrating freedom from disease is of major importance for international trade of live animals and product of animal origin. 
There is a minimal disruption to EU trade in poultry products, with the only condition being that poultry meat originating from the protected zone is restricted to the national market. Their country trade, however, has the potential to be significantly affected with each trading partner unilaterally determining the scope of restrictions it places on NA poultry produce. Dear officials are working with counterparts in DEFRA to clarify concerns that they, as they arise for the purpose of supporting the industry to main, maintain market access. For retail trade, the Food Standards Agency have determined that the risk to human from infection, humans from infection by poultry, meat or eggs is low. There are official controls in place for all poultry, meat and eggs coming from within the zones before they are placed in the market and considered fit for human consumption. Um, can I seek any comments from members? Um, Philip, you've indicated there. I see your hand up. Hi, Chair. Uh, I mean, I think it was a welcome report, but I have a number of uh, just questions that maybe I, I would suggest the committee could uh, write back to the department on. I mean, for example, it's saying that the disease of animals order of 1981 provides legislative powers to DERA. You know, when was that's 1981, so it would be useful to ask when the order was last updated and if there are any gaps. Also, in terms of legislation, saying legislation for disease has been laid to provide further powers in respect of those diseases which present risk uh, and impact. So, I mean, I, I think we should be asking when this will come into effect. What further powers uh, will the department have regards to the control and prevention of disease? And then, obviously, given the, the context of Brexit, I mean, we're aware of uh, our vets and, and, and officials' challenge with regard to that. So uh, it would be useful to ask, is the department the vet, veterinary capacity to meet the challenges uh, of this flu, particularly in the context of Brexit? And then also, in the report states that notifi notifiable uh, avian disease has been negated uh, in a further six holdings in the north where suspicion was reported after veterinary investigations were carried out, you know, it might be useful to ask for more detail on that. So that, that's just a number of issues or questions I would like us to write back to you on. Thank you. Claire? Yeah, thanks, Chair. And just, um, yeah, I'm looking at that there's, it states that there's a minimal disruption to EU trade in poultry products with only, the only condition being that poultry meat already originating from within the protected protection zone is restricted to the national market but third country trade however has the potential to be significantly affected um, each trading partner then unilaterally determines the scope of the restrictions it places on ni poultry produce and we know that this is a, a, a significant sector uh, here so i'd be keen to find out what's the breakdown of percentages for how much of our poultry products are sold either in NI, UK, EU, um, and third country markets. Um, you know, what country make up our third country markets? Okay. Noted. Stella? I'm still writing, but yeah. Okay. Everybody? Okay, thank you. So we'll fire those questions to, for response to the department from uh, following today's report. Okay, item uh, 17 on your agenda is a written briefing, uh, statutory instrument of the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Kyoto Protocol Registry Amendments EU Exit Regulation 2021. Uh, the brief is in the table of papers and to the department papers of page 203. Uh, these UK wide regulations are being drafted by BEIS with the intentions of laying them in Parliament on the 18th of February. 2021 subject to affirmative resolution. The committee is asked to indicate if, if, if it is content for the DERA Minister to give consent for UK Ministers to lay the statutory instrument in the UK Parliament. The committee is asked to outline any comments or issues it wishes to draw to the attention of the Minister. Um, the purpose of this SI is to ensure that retained EU legislation related to the UK's Kyoto Protocol uh, Registry is amended to ensure that it will be operable in the UK. The SA also amends two pieces of domestic legislation, namely the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme Amendment and National Emissions Inventory Regulation 2005 and the Environment Act 1985. The UK's access to the EU's KP Registry system ended at the end of the transition period. The IT platform for the new UK KP Registry is in development at the moment and is due be operational in spring 2021. For the period between the end of the TP and spring 2021, KP account holders have been advised to open KP accounts in other countries if they wish to trade KP units during this time. 
His advice to KPA account holders was published as part of the technical note on meeting climate change commitments on the government website in August 2020. There is currently only one Northern Irish company which trades in the registry. The Revenue Agency will re remain the national administrator of the UK KP registry and its role and responsibilities will not change significantly compared to activities that are carried under the EU registry system. Um, okay. um, if members any members any questions you want to raise this, because we have a couple of officials in standby. If you have any questions you want to raise, yeah, yeah, okay. We have John Mills and Richard uh, Coy on standby here. Claire, do you want to ask John or Richard some questions? Thank you. Yes, Chair, please. Right, John or Richard, there, Claire, go ahead. Um, yep. uh, sort of looking up. So the the Kyoto Protocol finished then, um, and the Paris Agreement took over on the 1st of, of January. Um, and Article 6 of the Paris Agreement allows for that emissions trading. But are there any implications for the new UK emissions trading scheme of the Paris Agreement taking over? Um, sorry, Richard. Okay, you go ahead. For that one. Um, yeah, Claire, uh, Claire, thanks for the question. Yeah, under phase three of EU ETS, uh, companies were able to use, were able to use uh, Kyoto Pro Protocol units to fulfil their ETS surrender obligations. But that's not the case now for, under phase four of the EU ETS, nor for the new UK ETS that's been established from the first of January 2021. So uh, no implications for participants in the UK ETS or or the EU ETS going forward. Okay, that sounds like easy. <laughs> Okay. Have enough, Claire? Yeah, thanks. No problem. Um, okay. Philip. Philip, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Chair. And, and completely off grid. Uh, I, I, I just noticed or note, obviously, like the whole world, the, ch the change uh, uh, in presidency in the US, and, and hopefully a very positive change uh, with regard to. Climate action. I, I think uh, President Biden has already uh, reaffirmed uh, commitments to go back into the Paris Agreement and, uh, and, and implement other uh, climate change. So anyway, I just wanted to make that point. That's positive uh, for all of us interested in protecting climate change and our environment uh, long term. In terms of this protocol, I'm just noting and. Uh, you know, it's mostly about uh, Britain and staying in line uh, with agreements made with the EU. But on page 207 of the report, uh, you know, there are aspects of the SI that you would normally have identified maybe impacts, non-impacts with regard to Irish protocol. And there it doesn't seem to be anything in there. So I'm just maybe asking, is that because the A, there, there isn't any or, or is there any other reasons why that... that that type of paragraph that would normally be contained in these kind of reports isn't there. Uh, yes, that's correct, Mr. McGuigan. The, the, there is no uh, Northern Ireland Protocol implications. This is a, a you know an international uh, convention, um, and uh, it's 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 very much a withdrawal thing that uh, basically required because the the EU used to uh, fulfil the UK's obligations and and admin. Um, uh, and because uh, the UK has left uh, the EU, uh, the, the UK needs to set up its own admin to, to comply with this. So that's all that's happening, and there's no uh, Northern Ireland Protocol implications. <clears throat> Grand job. Thanks, John. Okay. okay. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much for, for your responses there, um, John and Richard. Uh, so... Are members, I can tell you note this SA as previously agreed. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you, uh, John Richard. Um, correspondence. Uh, I wonder if our members to correspond received three sixty as pages three sixty two to six hundred thirty four of your packs. I want to refer members to the correspondence from the examiner of statutory rules in the table of papers and ask members to note that the ESR has I provided note on the following ESRs that are nearly out for um, out of their statutory period. The SR does not draw uh, special attention to any of these SRs. Uh, SR 202303 EU Fertilising Products Regulations 2020, SR 202304 the fluorinated gases, greenhouse gases and controls on oxygen depleting substances, exit regulations NA 2020, and SR 202319 the seed marketing and fertilisers and EU exit regulations NA 2020. 
was already considered uh, and indicated was content with these SRs. Um, uh, can I seek agreement to action any other items of correspondence suggested in the index, page 54, 361? Okay. Um, okay, 19, on your pack uh, is uh, any other business. Does any other members want to um, highlight? Yes, can I come in with yes. one, yes, please? Yes. It's just um, going back to the locks agency and um, in regards to their um, status as a statutory consultee. Um, if the chair is willing and members as well, could we write to the relevant minister and ask that they are specifically listed as a statutory consultee because what we were hearing there is that they are generally consulted but because they're not specifically listed and there's no mandatory duty to include them that that puts them at a disadvantage and when we look at the fallout from the mean and bog for example there's going to be many more examples out there as well of course um that they don't have the same status or come back or maybe legal come back there in terms of judicial reviews or whatever but i think that they're a very significant agency that do some really really good work um so we're hearing there that in particular under schedule three of the plan and general development procedures order in northern ireland 2015 that they could be listed so could we write and ask if that would be reviewed by the minister Fair enough um philip Chair, just, just to raise the point that, you, or follow up on the point that you, you raised earlier on in the committee about the, the news about the agriculture minister and his, his battle uh, with, with cancer, I, th I think it might be appropriate that as a committee we, we wrote to the minister uh, uh, wishing him well uh, through this, him and his family well through this, uh, but seriously, uh, a worrying time for him. Yeah. Great. I just was about to propose that myself, so you get in ahead of me, Phil. So. Yeah, that was right. Yeah. I think, are you okay? 100%. I think everybody would agree with that, wouldn't I? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, get that done as a matter of priority. So, okay. So, um, members, we're just facing off here now, but we just have to go into closed session uh, briefly to discuss the Fordbrook pro our, our Ford Brook programme and our approach to the Common Frameworks uh, document. Common Frameworks. Um, next meeting will take place next Thursday, the 28th of January. Month's nearly over at 10 o'clock in this room in Parliament Building. So thank you for your attendance and we'll just move into closed session here. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.